The Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 690 for Tuesday, January 2nd, 2018. You thought I screwed it up, didn't you? And welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where you send in tips, questions, and cool stuff found with the goal being, it's 2018 after all, that each of us learns five new things each and every time we get together. Yes, whoa, folks, whoa, whoa, we're whoa. leveling up for 2018. It's five. That's what we're going for. No, you're raising the bar. I, that's correct. Oh, it's pretty high. That's correct. Five? Five, man. It's five. Sponsors for this episode include... Smile software or smilesoftware.com slash podcast, where you'll learn about Smile's PDF pen for both Mac OS and iOS. We'll talk more about that here a little bit later. And also Eero, the whole house Wi-Fi that actually works. Uh, and we've got uh, a coupon code for you and all kinds of things. We'll talk more about that later on in the show here in very cold Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Likewise sub freezing fairfield connecticut this is john f braun how are you doing today john f braun other than being cold well just the uh, you know um helping uh, the gas company make money yeah that's right <laughs> that's the goal my heat's been on constantly man <laughs> but then again it's sub like i said sub freezing like single digits not below zero fahrenheit but um Close. I, okay. I, I think it's going to happen next okay. uh, couple of nights. Yeah, it's about 11 here uh, right now. But every morning when I've woken up, it's been, uh, you know, well below zero Fahrenheit. Uh, I think today was pretty warm compared to the last week. It was only, I think, may, negative two. Whereas uh, ah. the other day it was negative seven. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been cold. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, let's just jump right in. We'll, we'll, we'll warm things up by answering some questions and see what we can learn. We'll start with Bill, who says, I recently tried to use the markup feature in photos on my 9.7 inch iPad Pro running the latest iOS 11 to one. However, when I try to save changes, I get the message. I get a message in a pop up that says unable to save changes. An error occurred while saving. Please try again later. Later seems to be never, as it doesn't work in the future as well. I've been able to successfully use the markup feature on the same photos on my iPhone 8 running iOS 11.2.1 and on my Mac running High Sierra. While this may seem an adequate workaround, I desire to use my new Apple Pencil on the iPad Pro to make any markups. I have found that if I first crop or rotate an image on my iPad Pro, the markup feature will then be able to uh, be saved. However, that's not really the workaround I'm looking for. Once an edit is made on any device, it is properly showing on all devices as I'm using iCloud Photo Library. So I'm going to ask the, the the simple question first. And I, I know, I know, but did you restart your iPad? Because a lot of times that can solve these kinds of weird problems. And I also know certainly from personal experience that we generally tend not to think about restarting our iPhones or our iPads. It's, you know, they just, they sleep, they wake up, they're just always there. And so it could be weeks that we don't restart these things. So when you have a weird problem like this, try restarting your iPad. Um, that said, let's assume uh, that that doesn't work. Um, I did a little digging and I found a stack overflow thread where a third party developer of a, a third party photo extension was saying that his photo extension was suffering from the same error and the solution. And this is where it gets interesting. His solution was that turning iCloud photo library setting from optimizing storage on the phone, which only downloads thumbnails for everything and, and doesn't pull down full images unless it decides that it needs to and we'll put an asterisk there and come back to it. Uh, he changed it from optimized to download all photos, which pulls down full copies of everything. And then it worked. So that gets interesting because iCloud photo library is on in Bill's case and he's not able to save a change. It makes me wonder if for whatever reason his iPad isn't pulling down the full copy of that photo 
when it goes to edit it. It should, when you go to view a photo, it should pull down the full copy at that point and not just the, um, you know, the thumbnail. So, it, you know, it makes me, again, I sort of keep coming back to this, hey, let's restart the iPad and see if it resets whatever that cache is, and maybe that'll do it. I hate to, especially in this scenario, I hate to suggest sign out of iCloud, sign back into iCloud, because that can cause a whole resyncing of that iCloud photo library. But that may, in fact, be what's necessary here. There might just be something a little bit confused. The, the, the you know, the, the uh, another sort of indicator that this is exactly what's going on, although we don't know, you know, the one true fix is when he says that if he crops or uh, rotates a photo, then this works. It's like, okay, well, so now it's transitioned from being over there to on device and now it's able to save to it. So I, I'm hoping a restart fixes it. Otherwise, I, I, again, you know, troubleshooting iOS so very quickly comes down to turn, you, you know, if, like wipe it out and come back. Thankfully with iCloud, we don't have to wipe out the whole thing. We don't have to do a restore from a backup, but you do sign out of iCloud and come back in. A lot of times that'll fix it. Any thoughts on that, John? We're going to go into more detail. Um, it was a question that I researched a little while ago, and it had to do with the format of photos. The, the only reason I mentioned this, Dave, is that it, it regarded the how you can access your photos um, on your iDevice yep. with various things on the Mac. And one thing I found in brief was the setting that you had mentioned, which is changing the optimization, change the behavior of the software on the Mac. So I just want to re reinforce what I think you just said is that sometimes you have to do that. Um, no, it's I, just think, odd, it's I think odd you're talking about up. two different, two different settings. I'm talking about the iCloud photo library setting where you choose whether it's going to download everything from yes. iCloud photo library or just, Thumbnails, whereas I think you're talking about the format of the pictures. Oh, that okay, it no, shares. the optimized storage versus. Uh, okay, so it's a, but it's a similar, similarly named it, setting. Completely different, though. It, it, it okay. two different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because one is in the one I'm talking about is in settings. iCloud. Then you go to your Apple ID iCloud photos and and then when you have iCloud photo library turned on it's either optimize iPhone storage which is what Bill has or download and keep originals. Um I think right. the one you're talking about is in Oh no, that's the that's the setting that we'll, we'll talk about it later but, but, okay. but it, it, it's just oh. interesting that changing that setting on the iOS device affected the behavior of of other parts of the uh iCloud ecosphere shall we say. That's well, what th I th then then let's dig into that because I, I I'm not sure I I'm not sure I mean maybe it's helpful for Bill. So what what do you what did it change? Changing that on your phone from optimized phone storage to download and keep originals, what did that do? What it changed was image capture. So when Oh, for the thing sure. Is, it, well, the thing is inadvertently I had activated iCloud photo library. Okay. On my device. So I'm going to go down with memory here, unless you want to bring up the question. That's but um, from memory here, so so the problem was, um, when I when I run image capture, I see the photos. Uh, it, it advertises the ability to download them in a certain format, and that's not what I want. And I'm like, well, yeah, that kind of sucks. And then I re then I inadvertently had activated it on my phone at one point. So what I did is I deactivated it and then reactivated it. Deactivated iCloud photo library is Correct. The, the it here. And then, okay. and then re downloaded, but made the choice to do the, the rather than optimize storage, use the other choice. Yeah. Okay. And I found that then when I ran image capture, it was like, Oh yeah, they're available in the new format. And it's like, well, that's weird. Uh, yeah. It wasn't no. really documented anywhere. They have an article that talks about it, but it, it, we should go into more detail. Yeah. It, On that so, question in a, a future episode, it, it's just it, it, the behavior is related, which is why I just thought I'd babble about it. That's it. No, that's interesting. <laughs> um, we, what when you said it was a different format, you, you're talking about it. You were just seeing the the thumbnails in that folder that you can't touch with iCloud with uh, with with um, uh, uh, image capture. Right. Well, image capture 
with the old settings showed yeah. the photos as JPEGs. With the new settings, it showed it as the the new format. Oh, HEIF or whatever. Yes. Okay. Or HEIC, I think, when it saves it to a to a file. I guess it's variation. Oh, I'm right. Like, that's oh, yeah. Well, that's yeah. kind of weird. Yeah. 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 Huh. So it just made me scratch my head is why is the, the Mac software behaving differently? And it's because, well, I think it's because I changed something on the iOS side. Yeah, it's not that the Mac <laughs> or the iCloud is, side. It's, it's not that your Mac is behaving differently. It's that your Mac is seeing different data is really what right. it is. Right. And I it mean, could be all based in iCloud, which well, was your su suggestion, too, though. Then, you know, the log out log in thing is always makes me kind of jumpy because. Yeah, a lot of times yeah. that's the solution, though. Well, it's right. tra it, it's traumatic, though, because yeah, you get all be. these warnings when you do it. Totally. It's totally. It makes you think you're going to lose everything. Yeah. All right. Let's. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I'm curious if other folks have seen this. Um, yeah, it's interesting. And uh, actually, you know what? Before we move on, I, I'm curious, though, if you because you said it changed from JPEGs to HEIF. And, and that's where I thought you were going with this, which is why I said, no, that's a different setting. Um, if you go in on your phone to settings, photos, I'll uh, get this. Yes. Down at the bottom, you have an option where it says transfer to Mac or PC. It can either be automatic or keep originals. Uh, automatic will either expose them as JPEGs or HEIF, depending on what it thinks your Mac is capable of. Whereas uh, keep originals will show whatever they were taken with, which and you know, now with iOS 11 is HEIF. So which one do you have yours set to? Settings. Settings photos go all the way to the bottom. Drum roll. The photos. I've got a drum maybe uh, uh, three feet too far from my hands to do this. Photos. All right. And you're saying at the bottom, uh, keep originals. Okay. So that's interesting, right? So you're, it's going to force any device that sees them on your phone um, to see them as HEIF, like the, the format that they were taken in, whereas right. if you set that to automatic. So I think it's a, it's a combination of, yeah, I think it's a combination of that setting, which I never yeah. touched. It was just that way. Yeah. And how you have iCloud photo library that has. Sure. Cause you, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. And then you can also Alex in the chat room at uh dot com slash stream also points us to the other place where you can take a look at this, which is settings, camera and image format or formats, not, not image formats. And that's where you get to choose whether you're taking your pictures in this uh, high efficiency format or JPEG more compatible oh, format. Oh, duh. Look at that. Preserves a grid. Scan QR codes. Record video slow-mo. Wow. Formats. Yeah, formats is what he's talking about. But yeah, you're, you're right. This is this this setting, uh, you know, is one of the things that solves a lot of headaches for people. So again, we're in settings camera on your on your iPhone. And and the first option there, preserve settings. This is one that uh, for people that don't like to take live photos, this is where you want to come in and set this live. I know it seems weird, but you're going to come into this preserve settings and set live photo to on because that preserves whatever you have chosen as the live photo setting from session to session, as opposed to just turning it back to, to the default, which is on. So if you don't like live photos, come in here and I know it's weird. Settings, camera, preserve settings, turn that on and then and then turn it off the next time you go take a picture and you're good to go. Um, wow. Yeah. The other thing in here, settings, camera, uh, scan QR codes. I know we talked about it on the show, but if you turn this on, anytime your camera sees a QR code, it will put the contents of it um, on the clipboard and also in a notification so that you can do something with it. Uh, so there you go. Yeah, some yeah. fun settings in there. I know, it's crazy. Say, uh, just wove a tangled web and I think learned at least three new things. We might have checked off all five, you know. <laughs> three to five, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, we're done. We're That's done. All right, it. man, thanks. <laughs> sure. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Happy New Year. Uh, okay, now let's go to David. Let's see what he has to say. That was good. Well, wow, I like that. Uh, it, David asks, he said, I got a new Synology for Christmas, but... 
I, I'm going to stop right there. This is about movies, not about Synology. So even if you don't have a disc station, you might still want to listen to this question instead of hitting the uh, skip thing to a new chapter. Uh, he says, I got a new, but if you don't care about movies, then you should skip. Uh, for Christmas, and I've been working on moving all my media, mo photos, movies, and music to uh, the Synology raid. When trying to move all of my Apple purchased movies over, none of them are playable. He said, I suspected this would happen. He says, I do have Handbrake and VLC installed on my Mac. So I went about trying to remove the DRM protection from my movies, but they all say uh, they start in Handbrake with no movement on pass one of one 0.00%. At first, I thought maybe I was just being impatient. So I left one movie attempting to convert for over 24 hours with no progress at all. When I view the activity log, there are no signs of errors or anything else. Uh, he goes on to describe the rest of his setup. He says, am I missing something here or is that the handbrake or is it that handbrake and VLC are no longer able to remove DRM for me to use on a different platform? So the answer is, I don't think handbrake and, and VLC were ever able to remove this DRM. Um, together, they allow you to remove the DRM that's on a DVD. And so that's probably what you were thinking of, David, but. They were never able to remove Apple's DRM. Uh, which I did is fair play, or so they say. Yeah, I think is the name of it, which involves some sort of encryption and some sort of key. And the thing is, unlike the you know other ripping software, I guess nobody knows the master key, or they're afraid that Apple's going to right, right, <laughs> strike them down if they do. That. If they share the master key, but yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, I think it's fair to say that we don't know what Apple's master key is. But I have found a piece of software, and I wrote an article about it a couple of years ago called NoteBurner. And there are others, but NoteBurner is the one that I've used to do exactly this, uh, where you can take the movies that you've purchased from Apple and strip the DRM from them, and then you can you know, use them on your, uh, on your devices as you see fit. So obviously, with great power comes great responsibility. You don't want to do anything that's illegal. Or at least I don't want to tell you to do anything that's illegal. I can't tell you what you're thinking. But uh, but yeah, Noteburn, Noteburner has worked well. It, they say that it's lossless conversion uh, or DRM stripping. <laughs> there's there's some question about that. Uh, it's The quality is pretty good. In fact, the quality is really good. But in terms of it truly being a lossless conversion, I'm not quite sure that that's correct. But it might be. Your mileage will vary. So. We'll put a, we'll put a, we'll put a link to all of this in the show notes, including the article I wrote a couple of years ago about, about no burner, but it's still. Uh, My only other thought is that you could do kind of a low tech analog or analog digital conversion. If, if you know where I'm going with this. Sure. Yeah. So if you have it in iTunes and you could play it on a screen somewhere, you could, you, you could get some sort of screen capture. Sure. And, and, uh, in real time, uh, you know, do a low tech rip of it um, is kind of the other. It's true. Around. Yeah, <laughs> I you, could wouldn't, think of. you wouldn't get I think the audio especially. I mean, it, it, the video would be limited by whatever capture engine you're using to to do the video and also what you're displaying to. Right. Because if you're just displaying to a, a window on your computer, then that's going to be the size of the movie you get. If you display to your full display, well, then it's limited by the size of your full display. So if you don't have a 4K display on your computer then you're not going to capture 4k output so just bear that in mind and i think audio is going to be massively downsampled for that but it could work especially if your goal is to just get it to be something that you could watch on your phone or whatever so yeah interesting all right and then moving on to brian who describes an odd issue. He says, since I updated my iPhone SE to iOS 11.2.1, I cannot connect to any Wi-Fi network except my own home. I updated my iPad at the same time and I'm having no trouble at all. I have tried to connect the iPhone at the homes of friends and family, and it simply will not connect. I select the Wi-Fi network. I enter the password. I get a blue check mark next to the network in settings. The Wi-Fi symbol shows very briefly at the top of the screen and then disappears. The blue check mark remains and selecting info shows the phone has received an IP address, but there is no connection. I've restarted the phone. I've reset network settings, he says, and I've turned off Wi-Fi in location services. But to repeat, I can I can connect to my home Wi-Fi with no problems, just not anything else. 
So that's interesting because the first thing I was thinking as I sort of began pondering this question, John, was, yeah, settings, general, reset, reset network settings. That wipes out everything mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the networks and can be really helpful to kind of rewind back to the beginning of our photos question, uh, our epic photos question, I should say. We, uh, you know, we, we lamented the fact that it, there are lots of places in iOS that you just can't go to reset things, even though it's very simple. Well, reset network settings is one of those places where you can go and can be very handy, but it sounds like he's tried that. So he asks, you know, is my only option to wipe the phone and start over? Um, maybe, but you know, if you have a mobile device management or remote management profile installed on your phone that can restrict you as to which Wi-Fi networks you're allowed to connect to. So it's possible that you've got some profile on there potentially that's run amok. And that might be the thing limiting you here because it sounds like your phone is actively successfully connecting to these networks and then deciding, whoa, nope, can't talk to that one and 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 sort of detaching. So if you go to settings, general profiles on your phone, take a look there and see if you've got a profile from something that might be a you know mobile device management uh, service that maybe something you played with and installed like a Jamf or a Meraki or something like that. And uh, you should be able to remove it from there. You probably have to restart your phone after you do. And if so, maybe that'll uh, that'll wipe it out. That's that's my thought, John. I don't know if you have any thoughts. Another thought is that it could be an issue with iCloud keychain mm. slash storing of your Wi-Fi profiles. And actually, it just warms my heart, Dave. I'm looking right now on my Mac Mini. Um, and so I went to uh, settings, network, uh, my Wi-Fi, which is currently not on, but then I click on advanced and in the Wi-Fi tab, Dave, you know what I see? This will warm your heart. I see SFO free Wi-Fi. Uh, <laughs> I haven't connected to that in like at least. Why is that even there? So what am I suggesting people? And I see some other things here. These are access points I haven't connected to in years. Right. Oh, my. What? What, where did this garbage come from? Well, you've connected suggesting? to them at some point and it saves it and syncs it amongst yeah. all your devices. What I'm yeah. thinking, uh, what I'm thinking, sinking, <laughs> is that it, you may want to look at that list and you may have um, weird things in there that are affecting the ability of your device to yeah. connect to Wi-Fi. Um, I'm looking right now and the, the thing is I haven't used Wi-Fi. I typically, uh, this Mac mini is wired, but still it's coming up with stuff in this window, which doesn't make any sense to me. So just another thought, if you have weird Wi-Fi behavior. Yeah, is, uh, for sure. S see what the shared access points among your iCloud account say. Yep. It's bitten me. Yep. It's bitten you, Logan, right? Oh, Logan. dude. Remember Logan? Oh, 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 <laughs> never forget, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think I've gotten it sorted out, though. I guess I'll find out because I think I'm flying out of Logan to go to. Well, you suspected uh, to see iOS 11 fixed that. Yeah, it, yes. it did. I think I was able to to remedy it prior to that. But but you're right. iOS 11. We're talking about I couldn't get the Boston Logan Wi-Fi out of my uh, my syncing iCloud keychain. And it would I would delete it from a device and it would come back from another device. And I think finally I got it. But but yeah, with iOS 11. It, it's great. It's like, it's so great. In fact, because what you can do with iOS 11 is per device, you can tell a device don't auto join this network. You don't tell it to forget it. So it still knows it still syncs your credentials around uh, to all your other devices with iCloud keychain. But on a per device basis, you can tell it whether or not to auto join. You can still manually join. It's great. But once you leave the network, it won't automatically go back. And actually I used that this uh, this past week, I do uh, these theater shows where I go play the drums, right? And I use, <laughs> I'm spoiled now. I use two iPads. I use the iPad Pro 10 inch, 10 and a half inch, sorry, uh, to read my music. And then uh, I'm, everything is on in-ears now there 
And to the point where like a lot of the band isn't really even uh, playing anything aloud on stage. It's, I mean, it's all coming out of the house, but in order for me to hear the band and the cast and everything, uh, cause I'm usually in behind a drum shield, I um, I'm on in ears. And so I have another eye, second iPad that I use to mix the, the levels of all the various things in my ears. I just run an app that wirelessly connects to the mixer. Well, the iPad that connects to the mixer needs to connect to a different Wi-Fi network than sort of the public Wi-Fi network at the theater. And it used to drive me crazy because I don't want my phone connected to the network where the uh, mixer is because it's not it's air gapped. It's not connected to the Internet, which is good. You don't want that one on the Internet because you don't want all the extra traffic. But um, but now it's great because I can set each iPad like I tell, you know, the, the one I use for the mixer. Don't connect that to uh the main Wi-Fi network and then on the other ones and on my phone, I can say, don't connect that to the mixer network. And it's brilliant. So yeah, makes, makes a lot of, uh, I don't know, makes a lot of good things. It's good. Alex has a, uh, has a solution for this. He said there should be a hide unused connections three months or older setting in the, uh, Uh right. Wouldn't that be good? Like if you haven't used this in a while, hide it. Purge. Well, purge. see, I don't know that you want to purge because if I come back to somewhere that I forget, yeah. well, but again, I, I don't want it to forget because if I come back to somewhere that I have been, you know, that I, I wasn't, I, let's say it's been a year. If I come back and the Wi-Fi password's the same there, I want my phone to connect. I don't want to have to go and yeah. dig, like find out from the restaurant or whatever, like what's the name of, you know, what's your Wi-Fi password and all that. I just wanted to remember. Deprioritize. Deprior. That's what you need. Yes. Deprioritize. Well, the thing is, you yeah. used to be able to do that. I don't think you can do that in that window anymore. Can you? Can you still mm-hmm. move things around? You can still move things around on the Mac, not on the iPhone, but on the Mac, you can right. set right. a priority. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hey, while we're talking about Wi-Fi, I want to talk about our first oh, yeah. sponsor, which is Eero. But I, I, I'm going to tell you, I, I, yes, this is a sponsor spot, uh, but I've got a story to tell uh, about something else. So... We'll we'll do most of the sponsor stuff, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about what I've done. So Eero is the home Wi-Fi solution that uses a mesh, meaning you're using multiple devices from Eero to create a blanket of Wi-Fi throughout your home, and it truly works. Both John and I use it, um, and it's it's stellar because you just set these things up. They can, if you happen to have Ethernet in your walls, they'll they'll all connect up. And uh, and and that works. But if you don't have Ethernet or if you have a mix and you want, you know, you need like more Wi-Fi somewhere where there's not Ethernet, which is sort of more often the case than not. uh, The mesh builds itself both wirelessly and wired. It, It like it automatically just figures out how to get connection to all of the the Eero points, the mesh points, and then you're good to go. And now they've got lots of different options now that they've come out with their second generation of hardware. Uh, the second gen Eero now actually has three Wi-Fi radios in it. It's got two 5 gigahertz radios as well as one 2.4 gigahertz radio. And it'll use all of those or a mix of those to do both front hall, meaning talking to your devices and also back hall to connect to each other. And now, in addition to that, they also rolled out something called the Eero Beacon, which plugs right into an electrical outlet and will connect uh, wirelessly to whatever you want. But it's really great because it you can just sort of tuck it out of the way and it's got a nice little night light in it that you can have turn on when it's dark. If you want, you can control that. It's actually the, the, the night light's pretty cool. And it's just fantastic because single routers generally don't work for most homes these days. Not only is it about coverage and a lot of times you'll have dead spots, but it's about bandwidth, right? If you've got multiple people in the house streaming all the time, you need multiple radios to be able to handle that uh, in a very, in a very efficient way. And that's, that's how it works. Uh, So I'm going to tell you about the, the offer and then I'm going to tell you a little story. So Eero is available at Eero.com. And with our special code, which is code MGG, you enter that coupon code after you've selected overnight shipping. And that coupon code MGG will get you free overnight shipping to the U.S. or Canada. So again, for free overnight shipping to the U.S. or Canada, visit Eero.com. And at checkout, 
select overnight shipping, and then enter the promo code MGG, right? So you, you pick which Eero bundle you want, and they've got different ones depending on whether you want beacons or Eros or a mix of both or whatever. Uh, then you add overnight shipping, then you add our code, and overnight shipping goes from costing whatever they say it's going to cost you to $0.00. And, zero cents. and again, that's for uh, folks in the U.S. and Canada. Now, John, I had um, I had a, an interesting experience. It turns out that 2017 was the year of learning lessons over and over again. Um, and and I've, I've talked about some of this, like I've just done some some things that I should have known, like like we talked about uh, spanning tree protocol. Right. Well, I had to learn that lesson again. I also had to learn the lesson about using a UPS battery backup. So I change things with my network all the time. And that makes troubleshooting somewhat difficult. But um, I had this issue where my Eero in the living room would, the light would turn red on it, which means that it wasn't getting a connection to the rest of the, the network. Hmm. And it, you know, and, and it, it would happen every, it, it was probably twice a week that this was happening. And I would reset the power on my Mocha adapters because I was using effectively, as far as the Eero was concerned, I was using Ethernet backhaul, but really I was using Mocha backhaul. So Ethernet over coax uh, to sort of string things throughout the house. And it, again, it worked great. And then suddenly it stopped working, right? It would, it would do this. I would, re I would cycle the power on these Mocha adapters and everything would, would work fine. And it happened again. And I'm like, man, okay, this is crazy. And I was right there when it happened at one point. So I went up to the bedroom where the other Mocha adapter was, you know, one's in the living room where it was having the problem and one in the bedroom. And I went up to the bedroom and I saw my switch. I have an ethernet switch up there. I saw it restarting. I was like, oh, hmm. well, wait a minute. There's a UPS here. Like nothing. Okay. At least now I know what the cause of this problem is. You know, it's, it's that the power, because we get power flickers every now and then you don't really notice them, but electronics notice them. And, uh, and so I looked and I realized that during our last power outage, I think the UPS up there in the bedroom had just like flaked out and wouldn't come back online. So I just unplugged it and plugged everything back in thinking, all right, I'll replace the battery or I'll get a new UPS or whatever. But things were sort of like mayhem in that moment as everything's coming back online after a couple of days of, of power outage or a day, whatever we had the last time. And I totally forgot about it. And uh, of course I had to learn the lesson again. Having these UPSs is really important because it keeps your electronics from getting freaked out and what happened was the one in the bedroom, the Eero unit in the bedroom would not come back online. And I was like, oh man, that sucks. Like I fried it, and, which can happen when you have like, you know, these quick little brownouts or whatever. Well, I went online and looked at the Eero settings. This is on New Year's Eve, right? Uh, like the, the afternoon of New Year's Eve. Um, and I'm like, oh, I know it's like a Sunday or whatever. They're, they're not going to be in the office. Maybe they were, but I went and, and dug around it, uh, in the website and it was like, okay, I figured out how to factory reset this thing. So that's what I did. And sure enough, it came back online and I was like, Oh, that's awesome. Uh, but of course I had to reconfigure it as soon as my Eero app paired up with the thing. Like I was going to have to go through the process and reattach it to my network. It said, Oh, Hey, by the way, this Eero is already connected. Like, you know, this, this, an Eero with this serial number, it's already part of your network. Do you want me to just like put it back and reconfigure it the way it was before? It's like, yeah, it was really awesome the way it, and it, and and now it just works. So the power flicker didn't damage it permanently. It just, you know, corrupted some software in there or whatever. So, uh, so on New Year's Eve, I, I ordered a, a new UPS for the bedroom and it actually arrived about an hour ago. And so I plugged it in and now it's up and running and that problem should be gone. So there you go. You know, it's craziness, John. Craziness. It is. I had something similar recently. Yeah. Uh, my aging uh, Drobo FS. Um, yeah, we had a, a, a glitch. So I, I just, like I just want to say, as we're, as we're doing this, because I'm not sure if I actually ended the Eero uh, <laughs> sponsor spot. So oh, one gee. more. No, it's okay. No. Um, I think I did. But but one more time. It's Eero.com. And for free overnight shipping to the U.S. or Canada, um, at checkout, select overnight shipping and then uh, use uh, the coupon code MGG to make that free. Our thanks to Eero for sponsoring this episode. 
All right, go ahead, John. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sure. No, all I'll say is that I had a similar, so one of those, you know, it's not a, a blackout or a brownout. It's just kind of a glitch where yep. the lights go out and they come on. Sure. And the Drobo, every now and then, at least the one that I have, the the older one, which I'm still very happy with, um, it was kind of in a, sa- in a state of, huh? In that I couldn't see it on the network. The lights were on as if it was operating. But when I tried to power it down, it didn't power down using the switch on it which is like okay you're you're confused so let's let's just disconnect power and then start you up again and sure it was fine but it got into a weird state where i think it lost power and then got it back and it was just it couldn't deal with the variation and it's just like okay i'm just gonna wedge and do nothing <laughs> sure yeah exactly yeah yeah it's funny though i have like you various some devices they're dead some flash the the clock saying okay something terrible happened and you know fix me right and right. some just <laughs> some just are dead to the world so, so yeah and and with this it was interesting because with the this was an Eero gen 2 uh unit mm-hmm. so it it's the one that that kind of you know looks like a it's about the size of an apple tv or whatever and uh it has a light on it to show you the status but because it's in the bedroom I've gone into the settings and told it, turn the light off. So the light never came on. And oh, normally okay. the light comes on while it boots up. And then it's like, oh, my light's supposed to be off. So I turn it off. The light never came on. And that's what made me think, oh, man, this thing's fried. Okay. But, I've only seen the red light twice. And yeah. both times it's been because my ISP right. did something dumb. Right, right. <laughs> but this was not, there was this was no light. Like the one in the living room would do red light because it wasn't connected. But the one in the bedroom, there's just no light whatsoever, even if I pulled power. So that's when I thought, oh man, this thing's yep. fried. But yeah. So Eero, we love you. Yeah, it worked great. I was really impressed. Really impressed. All right. Uh, you want to take us to brother, uh, brother Jay there, John? Brother Jay. I'm going to try. I'm going to try to condense this a bit here. Um, I'm going to start here, Dave. So Brother Jay says, seemingly randomly, macOS refuses to properly launch some programs. Transmission and Back in Time are the two which come to mind. I copy them from their images to the app folder, applications folder, and launch them, but nothing happens. I know part of their code runs because focus switches from Pathfinder or Finder, thus I must switch back. Um, And he also notes that there's some bugs in Pathfinder. Um, But he says, additionally, invocation of the force quit panel via command, uh, you know, the magic incantation there shows that the offending program shows the offending program. Okay, and that's that's normal behavior, is that we see something in the dock and it's stuck and you click on it, I guess. Um, well, no, he's talking no, about hitting command quit. option escape and then seeing it in the list saying um, uh, Wait, unresponsive. Is it command? Uh, yeah. Hold on, command option escape. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought it was a different. No, nope, you're right. And that's our sixth tip. <laughs> command option escape shows a list of apps running. And if they're wedged, typically it'll show them in red and put them in parens saying, yeah. you know, this app is being bad. Yeah. Unresponsive. Um, so we force quit. Yeah. So, um, and then he says that, you know, the ad, the troublesome apps, he also hears voiceover speak them. Um, so I gather Brother Jay here has um, a, a visual um, uh, impairment there. Yeah. So he needs some tools to help him out with that. So that, that introduces an interesting layer here. But um, so he tried a few things with these cantankerous apps that wouldn't launch. He did some sort of quarantine thing, which kind of makes me nervous, Dave. I'm not sure about you, but um, apparently there's a thing you can run from the terminal that will unquarantine apps. Hmm. I don't know. What do you think? I, I, <laughs> I've i never seen I per- that solve this I personally, particular problem. But, okay, I personally uh, would have never done a, a quarantine type of operation using XATTR and then some incantations. Um <laughs> So I guess the uh, the intent there was to reverse quarantine apps or maybe try to fix them, and I, I guess is is what this did. Um, he then ran some utilities, our favorites here: Onyx, Cocktail, Tinker Tool, to clear out caches and and other cruft. Um, but it still doesn't work, Dave. So I'm sad. So is it just? And to, he says he's I, baffled. Yeah, this and for anybody listening along, in case that wasn't entirely clear, what what's happening is he launches an app. 
it appears to launch, but it never actually becomes responsive. It, it doesn't get windows like nothing happens. And I've seen this kind of thing before, John, but, but right. go, go ahead. I'll, I'll let you I'll let you take no, it. You're right. Uh, yeah. But yeah. So it gets stuck. So it's a, it, it, it's in this. Quasi. Yeah, I don't know what to call it. But um, right. anyways, it's not doing what you want, which is running the app. It gets stuck. Uh, 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 so I'm going to call this a launch issue or an app launch failure is how I titled the thing, Dave. And there are a few things I could think about here. Um, one is that there are some specific, although he said he ran everything, I just wanted to make sure. Um, when you're talking about launching apps here, Dave, there are a couple of important portions of Mac OS that you may want to tweak or clear or mess with. Um, one, Dave, that we talked about, uh, so Onyx does have a specific setting. So um, one tab in it is called Rebuilding. And there are a couple of things you can rebuild, Dave. One is called Launch Services, our friend. Launch Services, well, what does that do? Well, that's kind of the database that handles all of the <laughs> mystery of launching an app. So clearing that out may do it. And then there's another thing called DYLD, which I think is dynamic loader or DYLD shared cache. That's another thing that has to do with launching applications. And if the dynamic loader, which is something that loads little pieces of software from other parts of the OS to make your app happy, doesn't work, that's another one. So I want to make sure he explicitly had done that. Yep. Um, the second thing I could suggest, Dave, is that a safe boot, um, always, well, sometimes, it can't make matters worse, or at least I haven't had to do that, but a safe boot also clears out some cruft, and a safe boot on the Mac right now, you hold down shift when you boot, and it'll probably at some point in red letters, last I check, it'll say safe boot to let you know that's happening, but that also clears up, um, could clear up some issues, we've had many people report that. And then finally, there throws in kind of thrown in the towel, Dave. But I, I, I've done it. I think you've done it. You go to Mac OS Recovery, which uh, I believe is a uh, Command R. You boot, and you say reinstall the OS. There may be a part of the OS that is just so messed up or damaged that reapplying it will fix the problem. And it has, in desperation, Dave. I admit, I I have done that. Yeah, for itself. sure. It, it can't make matters worse. Well, it could. I mean, you should have a backup well, before you do things like that. Okay. Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. So, um, so those were the, those why I don't know if you have any other thoughts on this, but it's, uh, it, but you said you had the problem. So I'm, I'm I, curious if you have any more detail. Yeah. On I've seen it before with, it, for some reason it happens a lot with iTunes for me where I get the, this exact symptom where I, I click to launch it. I can tell that it's trying to launch based on, you know, you look in, in activity monitor. Oh, it bounces. It, it, yeah. It, it bounces. Right? Yeah. It responds like, I got you. I know what you just asked for. And then it never quite gets there. Uh, and oftentimes it's because there's a zombie process of iTunes already running and it can't start the new one. But in those cases, a reboot totally solves it. So it's possible that's what's happening with Brother Jay here. And of course, if you're listening and you've, you have this happen, oftentimes a reboot is really the only thing. I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of my life chasing zombie processes on Unix. You know, sometimes you'll have the same kind of thing will happen, you know, like on a web server or whatever, there'll be zombie Apaches and you'll try to Apache being the, one of the right. engines that serves websites. And, you know, you'll try to kill it or you do a kill all or a kill dash kill in all caps, which is like a kill dash nine. And like sometimes you just can't get these zombie processes to go away. You just have to wait until you can reboot the server. Well, on your Mac, you probably have to wait less. Um, and and oftentimes that solves this problem. So, you know, I, I, I don't think that's exactly what what Brother Jay has experienced here, because I think he has rebooted. And still sees this even after a fresh reboot. But um, but that's certainly if you're seeing this at, at home, like those zombie processes and you'll see them in activity monitor. It'll be, it'll be like in my case, it's iTunes, but it, it's in parentheses like, yeah, I know it's supposed to be dead and it's dying, but you can't quite like jettison me yet. 
is basically what that's saying. Um, but it could also be, you know, like you said, a permissions thing. Brother Jay started heading down that path in kind of an advanced way with the extended attributes command, the XATTR command, where he was sort of messing with some of those, one of them being the quarantine thing. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know what the magic answer is. Are you still with me, John? I kind of get the feeling I'm alone here. I'm going to pause this because I think my internet connection just kind of flaked out a little bit. Is that going to do it? Am I, I believe we're recording and we are back, right? You're with me, John. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So this was interesting. I, I think we're yeah. done with the, uh, the app launch failure thing, but um, I think it, honestly, it's folks. Well, it's been, it's no. been about 10 minutes here. Um, but, but go ahead. Was there, was there something you wanted to wrap that up with John? Well, no, I, I think we're at the point where I was saying, okay, um, clearing caches is good. Uh, clearing the launch services and DYLD is good. And uh, I guess what was the last one there? Um, you know, yeah. Safe boot. Uh, yeah. Things that clear things up or, or OS reinstall. And I was wondering if you had any additional Tips well, or I mean, tidbits it, there when apps don't launch. I actually, I think you you probably again I'm missing the timestamp here. Right. Maybe you got through all your. I think we did. Sorry, folks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, so th this was in, what just happened here is interesting, and I I think it's a problem that I caused uh, right before we we jumped over to to do the show because I said that I put the new UPS in place. Well, I also put a switch in place. Over at the house, I replaced I, I had an old router in the bedroom that was turned into dumb mode. And literally, I was just using it as a switch. Nothing more. Um, so I replaced it with a, you know, just an eight port D link switch or whatever that I had, because why not? Well, uh, whatever I did caused a loop in the network um, over at the house. And the way I finally solved it here in the office was by disconnecting the house from the uh, from the network that way. And uh, and and then it, as soon as I unplugged the, the cable that runs between the office and the house, everything in the office came back up. But prior to that, nothing would happen. So it was definitely a network looping thing. I'm not entirely sure how I created that, but um, but I definitely created it. I, I think I don't know what it is. I don't even want to speculate. Um, but, but we are here, so we're going to finish the show and well, then I get to go I, troubleshoot. I just want to ask network you issue. to yeah. explain to the network, uh, to the studio audience, Dave, what is a network loop problem? Mm. Well, what, 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 what condition existed for this network loop issue to rear? Well, that's a question I don't have the answer to because I haven't diagnosed it oh. yet, but well, what's a network loop? A network loop is when you have two different ways of getting, a signal between two devices, right? So I have my, uh, my computer in the studio and my computer in the office, right? There should only be one way uh, that those two are going to connect over, or, you know, over Ethernet. And, uh, and a router figures that out, maybe. No, a switch figures that out, right? Or a I switch. Mean, I, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I wouldn't I wouldn't plug the same device into into two different switches. Right? I mean, you you'd have to really work hard to create a network loop. And evidently I did. But it, <laughs> if you um, it, you know, if you have uh, multiple network segments and somehow they loop back upon each other, what what will happen is all of your packets will be sent on both segments of the loop and then things start to cascade and and cause trouble. So. Uh, so evidently I have a loop over at the house. It might be this new switch that I put into place over there. And maybe when I was plugging things into it, I wasn't being entirely thoughtful about what I was plugging in. And it's possible I grabbed a cable I shouldn't have grabbed and just plugged it in. So now my family is over there wondering why they have no internet. But, right. uh, but so you know. is, it, is it the two pieces of network equipment on the network? are trying to do the same thing is that no it's that it's that you i literally have um a, a loop connecting pieces together it should like when two two devices are connected it should just be an end to end thing right a network should be a star configuration mm -hmm. and you should never have the star come back on itself and and evidently i have the star coming back on itself somehow now it could be Two Ethernet loop or two Ethernet segments being joined 
at, in two places, right? Ethernet segments should only be joined in one place, but it could be that two are being joined or it could be that I have, um, you know, uh, two devices connected both via Ethernet and via Wi-Fi as the same device, right? And looping traffic. Like you could connect your Mac via Wi-Fi and via Ethernet to your router, but your Mac isn't going to try and bridge those two connections together. It's going to treat them separately. As long as they're treated mm -hmm. separately, it's fine. As soon as you have a device that says, no, I'll bridge them. I'll bridge the Wi-Fi and the Ethernet. Now you have a problem. And I and it's possible that's what I've got going on, that I've got multiple devices right. bridging these things. So, so right. there you go. Yeah. So uh, we look forward to your detailed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I may uh, never know the true answer to this. I've solved this particular problem once before, and I'm not entirely sure, but uh, but we'll see. It could just, I don't know. I, we'll, we'll figure it out. Hey, uh, let's talk about Mike, because Mike's got something interesting going on, oh, too. Mike, Mike uh, wrote us. He says, I usually have about four or five external hard drives plugged into my iMac. Uh, four are two of them are four terabyte Western digitals and have their own power supplies. And the others are either two or four terabyte Seagates using USB power without separate power supplies. Those are plugged into two different anchor USB hubs. He says, my question is that every time I wake up my iMac, I get a notification that says USB accessories disabled, unplug the accessories using too much power to re-enable USB devices. He says, I'm not having any, any problems that I'm aware of that all the drives stay mounted and they seem to work just fine uh, in terms of accessing files and using carbon copy cloner and all of that. Is this anything I should worry about? So that's a good question. Uh, the first no. thing I would check is to make sure that your anchor hubs are actually being powered and and it would be worth checking the specs on them to see if they provide USB power. Uh, most powered hubs do, but I've seen hubs that provide power for like the, the hubbing of the USB, but not actually providing power back to the device, to the devices. An easy way to check it is to plug your iPhone in to one of those ports and see if it starts charging, right? That's, that's an indicator that the hub is going to charge things. I, and when I say that mm. without your computer being connected, right? So don't have your computer connected to the hub. Just plug the hub into the wall, plug your iPhone into the hub. It should start charging. If that, if it does, the hub's providing some level of power over USB. At least one amp. Correct. Correct. Right. That's right. Yeah. So at five volts, right? Uh, USB, UP, yeah. USB is five volts. That's right. Um, so th I would test that just to make sure that these hubs are providing the power that you think that they're providing. Uh, another way to do it would be to plug your hard drive into them and see if the, the drive powers up again without the computer being connected. It may not fully spin up without the computer being connected, but the drive itself should show some indication that it's being powered. So so that's that's one thing is just make sure that these hubs are doing what you think they're doing. Assuming that they are, um, then the next thing to check, or even if they're not, uh, the next thing to check is in. Uh, system profiler on your Mac, and you can get there by, um, well, you can find it in the applications utilities folder, or you can go to about this Mac and choose system report. Uh, look in the USB section there. So along the left, you'll find USB about halfway down. And as you click on each specific device in the USB device tree, which appeals, appears on the right, you'll see two entries, uh, among the many, there'll be maybe, I don't know, 10 entries there, 10 lines, and they'll each have current available and current required. What you're looking for is to see if something has less current available than is required. Uh, John, you've told the story many times on this show where in the past you found some devices misadvertising the current that they required. <laughs> And well, no, and they then, lie. And, well, they that's, lie. and that's what OS 10 or Mac OS is, is, is going by here. So if it sees that a device needs more power than it's, than it's uh, able to get, it's going to pop up exactly the message that you, that you got, mm -hmm. but it could be more than that. So it's worth, it's worth digging in and making sure that you've actually got power going to these devices where you think you do. 
because if your Mac is trying to power these, you might wind up having trouble. And in fact, it might not be the drives that are spitting out or that are generating this error message. It might be a mouse that you have connected, maybe something you don't use regularly or something else, right? So look at each device and and see if you have more current required than available on any one of them and then try and diagnose from there. Ah, that's what I got. No, I'm with you. The only thing I'll add, I may have hinted at in the past here, but the, the current available and current required settings based on the USB work that I've done, Dave, are hard-coded in the firmware, typically, of the USB device. Sure. The thing is, it can lie. It's not verifying that. Like, It's not verifying that value. It's trusting that the device is telling the truth. And the device can lie, Dave. Sure. It could be a cheap knockoff. It could be a poorly engineered. It could be advertising a, a capacity that is, which sounds to me like, so it could either be the firmware, maybe in the hub, though I don't know why the hub would limit you or one of your devices. Right. Is is not quite accurate. Yeah, so, it could be the hub. Of, I mean, the hub is going to yeah. have those same lines. You should, you know, take a look at those too and just make so sure. So maybe, yeah. actually, I would suggest pull the hub out of the equation. It sounds like, he was saying that he has two drives plugged into two USB hubs. So, you know, skip the hub, go to a port. The other thing to consider is that the USB in some Macs, especially laptops, gets kind of weird in that you would think that all the USB ports are on the same bus, uh, especially for the older models. That's not necessarily the case. So depending on what port, what USB port you plug it into. So, so to your suggestion, Dave, the thing is to get, the the lowdown on what your whatever Mac you're running sees via USB, you go to system info, hardware USB, and it'll show you the various hubs. Your your machine may have more than one hub, and some of them may be limited, right? In the amount of power they can provide. So um, it could be valid, or it could be, yeah. So more detective work. We look forward to your report. For sure, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very cool. Um. I want to talk about our second sponsor, John, which is Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast, where you'll learn about their PDF pen product line. PDF pen, they call it the ultimate tool for editing PDFs and going paperless. I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, even as the PDF features of both Mac OS and iOS have become more and more robust, I still find use many times a week with PDF pen. Uh, if it's, you know, adding my signature or just adding like the right date line to a PDF, there's, it's so flexible and so powerful. I can do way more with this way faster than I can with any other tool that I've tried to use to do the job. Um, you can split and combine PDFs to send just the right things out. You know, it's it's the end of the year, right? Which means you've got all of your year end stuff to send out to your accountants and your lawyers and all that stuff. Well, a lot of times these things are spread across multiple PDFs. And, and I do this every year uh, where I need to send a sing a, a bunch of documents to my accountant, right? So that they can he can go through and and you know, kind of crunch everything. Well, instead of sending him like one thing that says, look at page six of PDF a and pages seven through 10 of PDF C and page one and two of PDF B. Well, I can take PDF pen and move all those pages around so that they're in one PDF together. And then I can go into like say pages and type up a little, you know, note explaining what it is he's about to see. And I can make that, the first page of this multi-page PDF, and I can use PDF pen to pull it all together. I can even add fill in forms. Uh, you, you can make them interactive if you want or not. You can add page numbers. You can redact things. So maybe your accountant doesn't need to see your bank account number, right? I mean, you know, not that you don't trust your accountant, but maybe, uh, you know, you just don't want that information out there and, and it's on a need to know basis and your accountant doesn't need to know. So you cross that off, you redact it out. It's gone. Uh, if you've got documents that you've scanned, you can perform OCR optical character recognition on them. 
You can then find and highlight all instances of a specific term. PDF pen is super powerful and you can do all kinds of things with it. So I'm going to implore you to go to smilesoftware.com. It's a request, but I really think it's going to be a great thing. Go to smilesoftware.com slash podcast, where they've got links to all of their great PDF pen stuff. Our sincere thanks to smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Well, this has been an interesting episode. We're not finished yet. We've actually got... Uh, oh, no, no. We got David. And we, oh. We've got... Yeah, okay. We can do David, and then, and then we'll jump to our tips. Uh, David, has, uh, David has a question about managing his devices because he says, I've tried some searches and can't seem to figure out how to remove the second Apple Watch that's appearing in System Preferences, Security, and Privacy. He's got his Apple Watch set. Uh, that's where you go. If you go, if you're on your Mac, you go to system preferences, security and privacy in the general tab. If you have an Apple Watch, you will have a checkbox there that says allow Apple Watch to unlock your Mac. If you have multiple Apple Watches, which you might, we've actually got several listeners who have sent in questions that indicate you do have multiple Apple Watches. Or if you had to replace one, you'll see multiple checkboxes there for different Apple watches. David says, I recently broke the glass on my watch face and had to send it in for repair. When I got it back, now I have two watches that appear and I can't seem to figure out how to remove the old one. So this is interesting because there's, it, these are just like, this looks like a pre-built form on this page, like any other preference pane does, right? It doesn't look like you don't have the option to say, remove this so the question is, where is it pulling this from? And my guess is that it's pulling it from iCloud. So on that same Mac, go to System Preferences, iCloud, Account Details. And then when that comes up, click Devices. You'll see all the devices that are signed into your iCloud account. And your Apple Watch, or in David's case, watches, will be listed there. And you can remove them. Uh, I would only remove the one that you don't have anymore. But uh, but that's that I, I my guess is when you remove it from there, that's when it's going to disappear from this uh, security and privacy pane. And uh, David actually had a follow up to that. He said, well, if I remove my watch from there, will it remove all the health data from iCloud that that watch populated? And I, I don't I, I don't see any reason why that would be the case. Yes. Now, with iOS 11, health data is synced via iCloud that's handy if you've got multiple iPhones that are that are pulling in data but removing a device that's been contributing health data isn't going to remove that device's health data it is your health data and it's all right there but if you want shoot a backup of your phone first because it's all stored on your phone as well and then that way you're you're sure to make sure just just when you do that backup make sure it's encrypted either iCloud which is always encrypted or in iTunes check the box to do a, uh, a password protected backup. That'll encrypt it. And that'll include all your health data. You Any think? thoughts on that, John? Now you were suggesting the iCloud web page path to, uh, uh, most definitely not for your devices. No, I, I said were. system preferences, iCloud account details. Oh, I'm sorry. Then, no. Okay. But devices. on the Mac, okay. On the Mac. Correct. Yeah. All right. The only thing I wanted to add is that I have, in the past, observed odd behavior on my iOS device. And in that case, you go to settings, then you'll see your iCloud account that should be logged in, and you'll see the devices. And Dave, in the past, especially when I've transitioned from one device to another, sometimes I've seen superfluous, right? Superfluous devices in that list. And sometimes that's another place where these things may Oh, totally. Well, they, it should be the same list, right? They should if you be, do it absolutely. On your iPhone. No, yeah. I agree with you. But I, I've had cases where things that appeared in the iOS settings, Apple or Apple ID slash iCloud list. Yep. Didn't show up somewhere else. It was uh. like, well, that's kind of weird. It's like, well, let's get rid of it. And and the problem has been, yes, is like <laughs> you'll see two of the same device. And it's like, dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Got to get it out. That's right. But I'm with you. Sometimes the, the data just lingers and that's, that's not good. All right. Just lingers. Yeah. 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 For sure. I thought we had another 
question that was similar yeah, to that. A boatload of it. Oh, uh, we really? have yeah, we have all these these tips. But uh, so we will we will jump to our our tips and and get there. Uh, Bob and and actually many of you wrote in with various things. We talked about the transporter from connected oh. data recently, and. I mentioned how I tried to mount the drive from a transporter on my Mac and failed, leading to the assumption that it was a, uh, but you know, an encrypted drive or or something like that. Well, turns out, no, I, I was wrong. It's not an encrypted drive. I just needed the very latest update to Mac OS Fuse or Fuse OS X or whatever it is. There's a piece of software called Fuse, F-U-S-E that allows you to mount drives with other formats on your Mac. And it's what Transporter uses. However, there was some issue with the version of Fuse that I had because it hadn't been updated for the way Transporter needed it to be updated for High Sierra. And so the perfect storm presented itself and I couldn't mount the drive. There is now an update to Fuse that works with High Sierra and Transporter Drive, so you should be able to mount the drive from a transporter on your Mac. And we've had several of you write in and talk about doing exactly that. Um, listener Bob even pointed out that he wasn't able to see his transporter library at all until he did this, and then and then it worked just fine. So there's a there's a support article at Nexan, which is the company that now owns. The uh, the transporter product line, although they're kind of, you know, killing it off. But uh, but th it's there and they have a link to downloading OS 10 Fuse 3.7.1, which is the latest. And that should hopefully solve this for uh, for everybody. So thank you to everyone who wrote in about that. Really, really handy and um, very glad to hear that. So it's it's going to be helpful for a lot of people. Any thoughts to add to that, John, before we move on? I'm to the looking next on tips? my machine okay. here, dude. I got Fuse 371 on both uh, good. my Macs here. Good. So um, it's a good general purpose. I think Transporter was one of the companies that embraced it and that they used it as a, a part of it. it and it, it's not a bad thing to have installed. If anything, it lets you see different file systems. Which yeah. Is right. Right. Cool. All right. Uh, listener Jeff has a good tip for us. He says uh, he had a failing High Sierra install happening that he said he was able to fix it. And the good news, or he says, here's what he did. He booted from his carbon copy clone backup drive uh, and remembered how painful it is booting from a spinning hard drive. Yes. Especially one that doesn't have any caches built on it that need to be built on boot up. What? Your clones will always have to build their caches the first time oh, you yeah, boot from sure. them and spinning hard drives are like, I mean, terribly slow molasses. Yeah. Uh, he says he, then he formatted his internal SSD with APFS redownloaded the installer again from the app store. I think that's the key right there. Getting the fresh installer ran the install, but selected show all discs and installed it on the internal. And then it did its thing this time without the firmware update failure. He says, lo and behold, I rebooted off the internal drive to a brand new fresh install. What a drama, but all is good now. So this is good. Yes. Yes. So thank you for sharing that, Jeff. And let's see, uh, moving on to listener Dave, who uh, wanted to follow up about uh, expand drive. He said, um, he said, I put expand drive through a bunch of paces with Amazon S3, he says, and the bottom line is, I like it. We talked about Expand Drive in a previous episode, and uh, and he was going to dig into it for us, which he did. He says, I didn't try it with any other cloud service, so your mileage may vary with those. But um, he said, Expand Drive uh, currently supports S3, and it works great for him. He says, there were a few bumps in the road, mainly due to latency and other timing issues with S3. He says, uh, a file or folder might be created on S3, but might not be immediately readable. So as it was putting files up there, uh, it would create a folder and couldn't quite put it in there. But he said Expand Drive just sort of retried and dealt with it. Uh, and he said it worked quite well. So he said what I also liked about Expand Drive is that it is simple to mount a cloud storage directory as a read only drive just a checkbox in the config. He says mounting read only gives one 
great peace of mind when using cloud storage for archival purposes. A read-only drive prevents inadvertent finger fumbles from wiping out your archive, which is, of course, backed up somewhere else, but still. So thanks for that follow-up, Dave. That's great. I, I like the idea of mounting, say, Dropbox uh, as a read-only device. Like, that's uh, there's some benefit there. I like that. It's pretty good. At the right time, sure. At the right time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I like the fumble fingers. I mean, we've all fumble fingered. Yeah. That's Whoops, the I problem. deleted everything. Whoops. Exactly. Yeah. We had uh, an interesting Facebook discussion that I'll link to uh, where mm. Allison from uh, Podfeet, uh, from the Nusilla yeah. cast, she was having an issue. I think it was her mother who was having an issue getting to her bank's website and, and either logging in or seeing her accounts list or something. And Allison said, you know, I tried it on my computer. Uh, it worked fine. I tried it. You know, I had my mother try it in other browsers, not just Safari. Didn't work there either. And so, you know, we, we were going back and forth and back and forth. And finally, I think it was listener Graham who said, hey, what size browser window is she using? And what? that that headed us down a path. That what does that have to do with anything? Well, a lot of websites these days, most, oh, in fact, are built to use what's called responsive web design. Well, the client says, well, it asks you if you're on an iPhone or a... a yeah, no, I think the thing it is... it doesn't the, ask. The, That's not how it's done. Or you, t or you tell. You don't tell. The, what responsive web design is, is it looks at... Your, it sends you all the code to your browser, and your browser draws it depending on the width of your browser. And there are assumptions oh. made in the code saying, okay, if the browser is narrower than X, then it let's assume, let's draw the mobile version of the site as opposed to the desktop version. And you can see this. In fact, if you go and load MacObserver.com in a new window and then start resizing that window down and down, you'll start getting so first the iPad version and the, or first the desktop version, then the iPad version, and then the iPhone version. So does the server send the code for all the renderings? Yeah, it's in the... And then, and then the client picks which one is relevant? The, well, the client knows the size of its own window and right. draws, yeah, draws mm. what it's told based on the size. So it's just a series... The, the, so what the, I'm saying is, so the server can say, I'm going to send you a monster huge rendering and a, a itty bitty rendering, and you, the client, decide which one you want to render. Is that well, I mean, rendering works? is the wrong term. It's not like we're sending a graphical representation of the page. You're sending... Okay, but a description. A description, yes. Sense. Yeah, exactly. And Here's the description, what you should... Yeah. Yep. Right. And the description in the CSS, mostly in the CSS, sometimes JavaScript, but but it's all in CSS, basically has a series of, you know, if then statements for lack of a better, uh, a more detailed. No, I get it. Yeah. And it it says, OK, if 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 you have this capability or if the screen is this wide, you know, lay it out this way. If the screen is, you know, narrower than X, ignore these elements and only draw these and, and lay it out differently and all of that stuff, which is great. Because you can, mm -hmm. in that way, you don't have to visit like www dot you know macobserver dot com on your desktop, and then uh, mobile dot macobserver dot com on your phone. Like you don't have to do all that server sensing like people used to do okay. or whatever. So coded properly, yeah, uh, Mac Observer or Mac Gab or whatever. Yeah, no matter what device, Correct. will look pretty. Will look like functional. it's supposed to on that device. But what was happening with Allison's mom is she had her browser window narrow enough that her bank's website was rendering as the mobile version. And so she wasn't <laughs> getting well, no, like she wasn't getting the top of screen uh, menu bar that might have been buried in like a little hamburger menu or something that, that would have been more obvious on iOS. Well, I, th I think we've seen this sometimes yeah. some websites would have an M dot whatever dot whatever old school which was the old way of doing it saying okay here's the mobile version of Correct. our site which is like dude you're so behind the times you got to use css you got to yeah you got to do it okay. responsive that's exactly because right because they would look they would look terrible when they were viewed in a in a right. full size browser right because they were meant for a teeny screen okay so the, no the, the the lesson here is when especially doing phone support where you can't like that one thing that that you don't see is like how wide things are for people. 
And whereas it might be really obvious to you, like, well, why is your browser window so narrow? You know, somebody's just that they're used to that. So they're not going to tell you it's narrow. And that was what was happening here with with Allison and her mom. And uh, and so the lesson is think about browser width if you're having trouble viewing something on whatever, you know, um, device it is. So and then we had uh, we talked about earphones that would allow you to also hear ambient sounds in the last episode. Mm. And that we have two more solutions for that. The first is from listener stone who says, if you're looking for a crystal clear, comfortable, unobtrusive in-ear monitor, the ear hero at earhero.com uh, is by far the best I know of. He says with one caveat, these were not designed for big, full, deep bass. If that's a requirement, look elsewhere. Ear Hero, I checked out the website. It's built for like law enforcement and uh, secret service or whatever. It's the the tiny little, you know, almost invisible earbud that sort of wraps around your ear. Except for the big freaking coil that everybody sees. Correct. And they're like, yeah, you're secret service. Right. Uh, exactly. Okay. Yeah. But they are built to not seal in your ear. So you don't get, uh, you know, you're not sealed out. You can still hear ambient sound. So that's... Um, that's one. We'll put that in the uh, in the list here. So thank you, Stone. And then the other one came on Facebook from Terry, who uh, suggests these bone conduction headphones that actually sit around your head. Uh, and we will uh, we'll we'll link to it's the aftershocks at A F T E R S H O K Z, uh, the hmm. Trex Air and the Trex Titanium which uh, which are bone conduction earphones and would absolutely serve this purpose. So we'll put a link to uh, to that in the show notes, too. But that's a pretty cool thing. I, I like the idea of these. Um, I haven't seen them in ages, but Jabra, remember Jabra? Yeah. Jabra, that was like their big deal was bone conduction uh, earphones. Well, right. But they were you were actually wild. putting that in your ear. Right, right. Right. This doesn't but it was go conduction, in your, but it was still conduction. Yeah. This doesn't go in technology. your ear. This goes just around your head and, and there's a pad that goes sort of right in front of your ear, but it doesn't block your ear at all. Um, okay. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It looks And the other cool. group I want to mention, Dave, we haven't talked yeah. to them in a while either, but Eddie Motic. Yes. I, had, I think they were ER sixes. Well, those are, but, but I, those I, will block I, sound out that. Right. Well, yeah, it was, it was such a tight seal for yeah. earphones, which were, ones that I was able to tolerate. I think I had the ER sixes or something like that, but those, yeah, because they sealed <laughs> airplane noise out. It, it, it was a very, uh, yeah. very nice experience. Yeah. They were one of the, I mean, there's a ton like that now, but they, you're right. They, you know, 10 years ago, they were one of the first to, to really deliver that in a consumer package. Yeah. But yeah, they're, um, st they're still there. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. But they, Edemotic doesn't, doesn't serve this purpose, right? They don't have the, they don't have no. It's not in here. Uh, they're right. not invert. Uh, let me see. Hearing Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. And then we have a cool stuff found from listener Kevin, who uh, Kevin from Connecticut, as he likes to say, who says uh, I had an iOS experience that I would file under cool stuff found. He says I've been using an iPhone SE since July of 2016. And he said, at some point last year, I enabled restrictions. He said, uh, but I couldn't remember the four digit code. I had no clue. He says, after I failed six or seven times, the prompt told me I would have to wait five minutes before trying again. He said, I began Googling. Some advice looked like a scam. Some led me to believe there was no hope except to wipe the phone or put it in recovery and wipe it. He said, finally, though, I found some steps to follow that seemed like they would make sense. And he gave us a, a, a link to an iPhone life yeah. article that talks about how to crack your restrictions passcode. But he said the essential component is that you have to create an unencrypted local iOS backup. He said, thankfully, he had done one recently, but you could do one uh, on your phone. Just make sure that we talked about before with your health data, you want to check the box to password protect it. That encrypts it. Uncheck that box to make an unencrypted backup. And uh, and he said, you can find your password hash in there. And he used a piece of software called iBackupBot. 
and then uh, used a uh, to find he used a backup bot to find the hash and uh, of the passcode key and also the salt, which are the two things that are required to uh, to authenticate when you provide the right password. And because these are four digit passwords, uh, he used a website uh, that we'll also link to called iOS seven hash dot and they plugged the hashes into the website and the website started banging away at it. And it found his uh, his passcode in the three thousands range and he was good to go. So pretty cool uh, that that's possible to hack that. I like I like that. It's pretty good, huh, John? No. Uh, no. Kind of questionable. Well, no, yeah, it's hacking is good, but. You know, there's there's a hole, man. Well, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, if you can if you've got a unencrypted backup of no, get, your yeah. phone. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's it, it's the raw data. So if you can find that raw data, then uh, then you're good to go. I think it's pretty cool that uh, that he was able to do it. And, and kudos to iPhone life for um, for putting the article together to make all that happen. So pretty good. Hidden gems. Hidden. I like it. Yeah, it's good, man. It's good. It's good. It's good. All right. Do you uh, know what, bro? We have, well, we have some people to thank, John. Oh. We have, uh, we have quite a few people to thank. In fact, I want to start by thanking, uh, and I'm talking about you, our premium subscribers. Me? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Frank F. and Art C. each made one-time contributions of $50. So thank you so much to both of you. Uh, on our monthly $10 a month plan, we have, uh, in the last week, Elizabeth B, Greg S, Olga P, Michael L, Bob P, Jason A, Ward J, Jim E, Chris F, Petter H, Dave C, and the B man. All, uh, like I said, at 10 bucks a month. Thank you. On the biannual plan, uh, which defaults to 25 a month, we have Robert P, Jeffrey F, Richard S, Karen K, David P, uh, Michael M, Teresa B, Jason T, Michael P, Andy W, John I, Corey A, Joel F, Craig S, Dan E, all at 25 and uh, 25 every six months. And then we have Mary G at 100 every six months. Thank you so much to all of you. You uh, you rock. We couldn't do this without you. It's really it's a it's a holistic thing that it all takes to put this together, and and you're a huge part of it. You're all a huge part of it, to be perfectly honest. Without your questions and your tips and your cool stuff found, and really all your participation, any way that you can get engaged and involved, it makes a huge difference for us. It is what we do here, and uh, it's awesome. So we had another great year, and we're looking forward to uh, 2018 yep. being and Dave even better. You know yes. what else we're doing? What are we doing? <sighs> Well, you and I and, well, some other members of our staff are going to Vegas for you, the listeners. Yeah. To experience the horror that is CS- CES. You know, I I, I get that. Like, the, the horror yeah. description. It is crazy out there, but I like it. I like, I mean, it's it, like the, the logistics of it are a pain in the neck. Getting around Vegas. Yes. Yeah. That is my, my yeah. biggest fish shake in that. Manhattan, I'm cool. San Fran, I'm cool. Even Chicago, I'm cool. Getting around, going to going to things. Though the most of it has been on the coasts. Yeah. But Vegas is just it's deceptive in its glitter and the size of things. I remember the well, first time I came out with there with you to yeah. go to CES, I'm like, oh, we just have to walk to that hotel that I can see from here. It's like an hour <laughs> later. No, it's no. like <laughs> what the and the public transport well it, it got much better with lyft and uh but yeah they were they're permitting the uh ride share yeah guys, lyft and uber the, and all that stuff thing. yeah but, um, for sure other than that it's it's a major it's the worst city i know of to get around to do a well, train show he, now though they're getting better they, they have the buses now yeah, they but, have the ferries they have uh the, the the management of the show i think has done a much better job of allowing everyone to get from here to there quickly. you're complaining about vegas in an umbrella <laughs> sense no 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 
it it really is only bad during CES and presumably New Year's, although yeah. I've never been out there for New Year's. But I've been out there for other shows, and it's cake okay. to get around Vegas. The problem All is right. CES brings, you know, an extra 150,000 people to Vegas. Yeah, well, it's an excess... It, yeah, it's just it's bursting at the seams is the problem. So yeah, it's not so, so that bad they can otherwise. manage this at all is is probably hats off to them. Yes, <clears throat> yeah, exactly, right, yeah. But Vegas in general is pretty easy to get around. It's just it's just CES <clears throat> pain in the neck and the shows and the food and the, yeah, and exactly. the this and the that. It's just that yeah, yeah it's crazy. <sighs> Hi, right, folks. Well, thank you, people. Well, thank we- you. For giving us, uh, for contributing, so we can go to CES and tell you about it's all true. the wonderful things that we're going to see. It's true. I think. Yeah. It's totally true. Yeah. Uh, feedback at MacGeekGab.com is the address that uh, that all of you can use if you want to send us anything. Yep. And, and although we have crystal clear audio, thanks to our new audio platform here. Dave, I think you said feedback. At MacGeekGab.com. I said feedback at MacGeekGab.com unless you're a right. premium subscriber, in which case premium at MacGeekGab.com is your uh, special email address that you get to use. We prioritize that. You can also call us 224-888-GEEK, which John is? 4335. And you can find us on Facebook. Go to MacGeekGab.com slash Facebook to join the Facebook group that we mentioned earlier in the show. Uh with all that stuff. I want to make sure we thank, in addition to everybody we've already thanked, Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Our podcast marketplace includes, of course, Eero, as we mentioned in the show, where coupon code MGG gets you free overnight shipping to the U.S. and Canada. Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com. Barebones Software at barebones.com. So much. Now I get to go figure out how uh, how to fix my network. You know what I got to make sure I do uh, while I'm out there fixing my network, John? Um, I, I couldn't even imagine the first thing to suggest, Dave. So um, hit me, bro. Well, it's that I got to make sure I don't get caught. Made up. Don't get caught, folks!